Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome, everybody, to another Lazy CEO podcast. My name is Jim Schlexer. I'm your host, and I am the founder of the CEO Project. Well, today we've got um, a guest, um, and what we're going to be talking about is, is marketing. So for those that you know don't get marketing, we think it's this big fuzzy thing that we throw money into and hope something comes out the other side. But it turns out there is an art and a science to this. And my guest is going to help us understand both sides of uh, the marketing equation and how we can maximize and get incredible results. Um, so my guest is Nancy Ruder. Nancy is dedicated to career to strengthening brands and the people that support them. She's got over 25 years of marketing strategy, uh, training, branding, and consumer research under her belt. Um, and she works with some of the great biggest brands that you could name, including uh, AT&T, Discovery, um, Georgetown University, Nike, Vail Resorts, Samsung Electronics, SC Johnson, as well as a number of smaller brands. She just doesn't do big stuff. She does small stuff as well. Um, I've known Nancy for, gosh, over a decade now, and um, she's been a resource to me and our organization, and hopefully she will be to all of you. So welcome, Nancy. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Very delighted to be here, especially because I'm quite a fan of your <laughs> podcast. Well, thank I, you. I listened to almost all your episodes. I loved the latest one on strategy. So it's exciting to have an episode with you. There you go. It's not quite Joe Rogan, but you know, I'll have to do. <laughs> he just has a slightly different flavor and style, but almost exactly the same. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, cool. Well, tell us just, let's start us out with, I gave a little bit of your background, Nancy, but tell us about Noetic. Tell us about your business and what you do. And then let's lead into the, the book and some of what you're talking about nowadays. Sure. Happy to. Uh, Noetic uh, rhymes with poetic. Sometimes people uh, want to know about the name. It it actually is a word in the dictionary that means to think or to know or to offer insight. Uh, I established the company about 21, 22 years ago now, and we primarily do uh, market and consumer research, brand strategy, um, a lot of components within that, um, training for marketing marketers and coaching for marketers. And it was really born of the fact that I started my career at a large ad agency, and I worked in a in a research what's called planning in the in the agency world capacity. I worked in biz dev. I worked in um, client services, and all of those skills really lent themselves to being able to branch out on my own and really focus in on that work. Um, importantly, we're not an agency; we're a consultancy. And why that distinction matters is we're not doing external communications. We're not doing advertising. We're not doing digital content generation. Ours is the inside the house work that enables that work to be well-informed. Um, okay. And particularly, you know, when you're seeking to build a brand or brands, you really need to build that clarity and authenticity inside the house if you expect to be able to be credible and authentic in how you're living it outside in the world. Yeah, I had just had this conversation with one of our CEO members. He's looking at branding. And, you know, I think he approached it initially as like, well, this is about a new name and pretty colors and, you know, branding, right? I go, no, branding is strategy. This is about what your brand offers and darn well better deliver on and have some logic and structure that aligns with your strategy. So the, when we, when I hear branding, most people think, colors and new names and a URL. And I think reality, and it sounds like the work you do, is let's look at the strategy and the positioning and make sure the brand aligns. So when you promise something to a client, they get it in spades. hundred um, percent. Yes. Very, yeah. very well said. And it can be hard for people to get their minds around 
Yeah. how foundational it really is because it really does touch upon should inform and shape everything you do. You know, who you are as a brand should drive what decisions you're making, what you're choosing to do, what you're choosing not to do. And it's very much um, the strategy part of it. And then it's the people side of it. You noted very wisely in your strategic planning podcast about the inherent uh, social nature of when you uh, set a strategic plan, how you need that alignment for people to actually do it. And you yep. need to walk the walk yourself as a leader. Same way with brand. You have to have it as something that people are living and breathing every day. And if you don't have that inside the organization, I don't care how wonderful and break through the creative you have out in the world and the message you're putting out there, people are going to smoke you out, yeah. uh, especially today, because people are really looking for that authenticity. So it is uh, definitely something that takes a great deal of work to, to set it and define it, and then to actually mobilize that within the organization so that you can live it authentically. Mm. Yeah. It's like, um, speedy cleaners we deliver in a week and a half right You're like mm, it doesn't work right <laughs> so you know with regard to sort of misalignment when you show up on the scene uh, how, how many organizations have let's say fairly profound misalignment of their brand and in fact what's actually going on in the organization is it all of us is it some of us is it like uh, what, what's yeah. your insight here? I would say it's degrees. Uh, and, yeah. and when and when clients come to us, I would say there's a handful of typical scenarios. Sometimes mm -hmm. they have not stood it up yet. And mm -hmm. you would be amazed sometimes at the very well-established companies and brands that we would know well who who haven't properly stood it up, haven't you know made the investment to do so, or they may be a newer organization where it's now time to stand it up. Uh, properly, I am a firm believer that you shouldn't start with marketing. When when you have mm -hmm. a concept, you know you need proof of concept, you need sales, you need operations to get settled before you really can hone that story. So typically, people are coming either because they haven't stood it up at all, or there's a problem. And so, to your mm -hmm. question about like how how bad is it, <laughs> uh, there can be a murkiness, which, you know, maybe is a little bit of a lighter problem, like, hey, we have an opportunity here. Uh, mm -hmm. But oftentimes we are seeing a misalignment and that typically takes the form of we're not sure who our priority audiences are. We have lost our distinction or we really never knew what it was. We are out there with too many messages about too many different things, and it's really taking our brand into a place of dilution and perhaps even erosion. And it'll show up in places like, you know, how are you doing with your market share? What's your level of demand? And as we all know, in the last few years, it's gone on to, you know, warp speed of those dynamics uh, at times changing really quickly. From 2020, when many companies just sort of stopped doing research with their with their customers, uh, you know their audience changed. So if you don't know who you're serving, you know that's that's a key problem. Or if you know who you're serving, but you really don't know what they care most about as it relates to what you're selling, also a big problem. So we see we see a lot of that. I think every organization has its Swiss cheese, as I like to say. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's more in the opportunity space and sometimes it's more in the, like, we have a big problem space. Yeah. Interesting. So when you're, you're thinking about brand and position, what's the balance of inside and this is really coming from the strategy podcast I did before what's coming from sort of an internal assessment of capabilities versus an external assessment of competitors market and so forth. And, or is it blended when we think about, how do I want a brand position here? Yes, it should be blended. We yeah. uh, we start on the inside because it's very important to know what people are holding. We actually have a tool, um, we call it a brand health diagnostic that uh, gives an assessment of the internal brand health. So mm -hmm. we, we use it with um, internal team members to really get a beat on 
how much understanding and alignment is there around things like clarity of audience, clarity of your offering, what's your point of distinction, all the way through to how well are you activating those things. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's super important to blend it. You have to really look at, okay, what are the results there? And then what's happening in terms of external perception of who you are and what you offer, because ultimately those things shouldn't be different. And right. oftentimes there are some key differences there. Mm -hmm. So let's say I find a mismatch, kind of more on the significant in this continuum we're talking about. Um, how long does it take to fix that? You know, in a medium sized company, you know, two, four, five hundred, a thousand people, like not a gigantic company. Yeah. I mean, it feels like a big change management effort to me, but I, I, maybe I'm not understanding. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It's very transformative mm -hmm. unless once in a while, someone will come and say, you know, we've made it our discipline to do this every couple of years. And what we're looking to do is refresh and refine. And then it may, you know, be quicker if they have that mentality and, and that mm -hmm. way of working in place. But I would say mm -hmm. typically the larger the organization, the longer it takes as you would sure. imagine, because you have that inherent, you know, sociability. So it, the answer of course, is that it depends, but I would say for a medium, let's say, um, you know, a medium to on um, the smaller end of large company, you know, your, your member base, typically, I think you're looking at a minimum of a six month effort. And uh, I also will say that like, that's the part of defining it and getting it clear the standing up there there's no there's no end to that the, you know the mm. way activating within you're going to have a more intense period of time of getting it activated internally uh and then you know getting it activated externally but you need to be uh, working on that really all the time. So just to make it tangible, let's say, for example, one of the pieces you determine that you need is you need a better metrics dashboard around your brand health. So you're mm -hmm. going to work intensely to stand that up. And then you're monitoring that quarterly, yearly, you know, making changes. Maybe part of it is you're standing up a brand ambassador program within your organization mm -hmm. to help people really understand and, and feel what the brand is about and, and, and comply, but also be ready to frankly evangelize. You're going to mm -hmm. have a more intense period of time to shape that. Uh, but then you're going to want to do the care and tending for that, that program. Got it. Interesting. Now you've written a couple of books technically one but there's oh there's two editions so knowing and i know you know well how the process works we're going to call it two because what i quickly learned is if you write a new edition it, it's just as big of a deal as writing a whole new book <laughs> okay well i'm you also wrote a book that wasn't for adults right uh no I don't think you I think did. So. okay so anyway so you've got a second edition of your book what was the original title did we change the title Oh, goodness. Yeah. The original title was way too long. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I did. You, aren't, you, aren't you a marketer? Like I know, right? <laughs> I know. What, what was I thinking? So the original sure. title was um, how to scale, how senior marketers scale the heights with art and science. Okay. okay. And then the second time, and it's not really technically shorter, but it's just um, how senior marketers scale the heights. And then I have a subtitle, which is um, what is uh, what is still true, uh, more true and newly true. So I wrote the book originally in 2018 and you can easily imagine the way in which the world changed in so many ways. And so I felt that it was important to, um, go back and really understand what was still true, more true, newly true. So for the, for the first edition, I interviewed over 50 senior marketers to unpack their ingredients for success. What, it, what does it take to be a successful senior marketer uh, today? And then I went back to a subset of those people and new people to do the new edition. Got it. So, I mean, without setting it up so nobody has to buy your book, what were the big sort of things that are different from before? What would be the big takeaways on these things really change? You need to pay attention to them. Yeah. And I think it's more of a, of a shining of the light, you know, on certain things. I think um, one of the things that was very much uh, more true 
um, is really what do you need to do uh, as a senior marketer? And I say senior marketer, it's a marketer in general, but the higher you go in the ranks, the more you're in that you know, decision-making place um, is, you know, how do you handle crisis, you know, when you have to move quickly? So the, one of the big um, premises of the book, you know, from the original is really the importance of having this blend of art and science. And we have a whole bevy of what we call art skills, science skills. And the long and the short of it is that, um, at the high levels, at least in marketing, while we do need specialists in the ranks, you really need to be able to avail yourself to that full range. Well, when in crisis, what uh, senior marketers were able to share with me is there is definitely a need in crisis to start with the art side, which mm -hmm. means leaning into your gut instinct, storytelling, creative problem solving, ideation, all of the things that would that would be on on that part of the brain, if you will, mm -hmm. and then follow with the science. When there is a risk to not moving quickly, don't wait for the data if it's mm -hmm. if it's not sitting there. So that was a key um, new thing. Um, I would say the other one that I would quickly share, um, and I call it in the book, you know, change is the new black. <laughs> used to be that Brown was the new black, you know, now mm -hmm. change is the new black. Just the hyper speed now that we're in with innovation. And, you know, I'm sure it's true for really every function and for business in general. Um, it has always been true for marketing that you just cannot sit still when it comes to all the different innovations that are at your fingertips. Um, it was really only about, believe it or not, like 15 years ago, we didn't have digital marketing. Yeah, amazing, it didn't right? Exist. Right. And so yeah. you think about how quickly things change. And um, marketers were telling me, you know, in 2023, just how important it is to really lean in and embrace the change and yeah. know you're going to make mistakes with it, but you can't afford to not be leaning into trying. Yep. You know, I, I wrote an article a while ago about uh, you only need. 80% of the data to make a good decision. And, you know, there are these people that grinded it to dust. And if you do that, you wait till you have all the data and you've de-risked the decision, you're now at the back of the pack. Because yeah. everybody else made the move earlier with 70, 80, 60, 50% of the data. And particularly as you, your point, in a turbulent environment where data just is not available, you don't right. have a choice. But I did That's really right. like the fact that you became quantitative over time. Because one of the things I think a lot of leaders find frustrating is, you know, marketing is hand waving and pretty PowerPoints. And, and they're like, yeah, but like, give me some numbers, give me some meat, give me something to work with. So I really appreciated you balancing both halves of that in your thinking. Yeah. And and I think that I am, I, I'm like a personal walking example of that because my, in my upbringing, you know, we all mm -hmm. have just, what is our circumstance? I was all art. You know, I, I, mm. I was, I was into, um, performing arts. I was, I was a painter, a writer, like everything I did was on the quote unquote art side. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the point, like even through college, um, and I got to the point where I, I understood that there was this whole other side and, and that it was holding me back that I wasn't stronger at it. So I did what, you know, people who like to self-torture do. And I pursued an MBA at, you know, the most difficult quantitative school out there. I was like, well, if I'm going to do it, let's just do it at university. Yeah. You know, and it yeah. really did enable me to avail myself of that other side. And it yeah. is, it's just critical, but, and one of the biggest things that's critical about it is knowing what to lean into when. And that's yeah, why, that. you know, the whole premise is around really being able to avail yourself of all of it. Uh, and we hold a lot of emotion around it. And, and I often tell people like when we do workshops around art and science to, you know, skill up marketing teams, I'll say to people, like, if you're sitting there and you're very art leaning and you have a lot of feelings about math and numbers that you've been holding since your adolescence, probably know that yeah. there are people in the room as well who lean heavily science, who feel 
a lack of confidence on their ability to be creative and to generate mm. ideas. So like we're all in the same boat that we hold certain uh, beliefs about ourselves that hold us back and you just need to like acknowledge it, set it over there and then lean into the learning. Sure. You know, I remember taking when I got my MBA, the poor English majors, you know, it was a pretty quantitative program and I'm an engineer by background. I'm like, oh boy, math. And the poor English majors are like, You're like, Ooh, oh, great. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to kill myself. It's math. Right. So I totally get what you were, you're going. I used there. to, I used to say when I was going through the program, you know, I am getting so much more value for my dollars mm. <laughs> than <laughs> the people who are here that, you know, came from investment banking or they're already accountants or whatever they yeah. have going because here I am like the liberal arts major figuring out how to do regression analysis but you know I I got through it <laughs> yeah you, you know I, I like the um I, I hear your point of like in the room there's somebody who has either the math the sort of science thing and people have the art thing but I think as we elevate as marketing leaders and ultimately general managers of businesses we've got to be able to speak both languages yes. right? at yeah. some level. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm a great art guy, but I kind of think I know good when I see it. Um, and I totally know the math side. So you've got to be able to cross into both sides, I think, yes. but also you need to have that top level business view. In other words, you have to get out of your functional marketing thinking and connect it to the overall business in a really strong way, which I think you touched on that as well. And yes. I think that is actually really important coming Absolutely. up a functional Element. Absolutely. And there's a lot of guidance in the book from these senior marketers about how they do that, because yeah. most people don't, you know, aren't born with a perfect balance of these skills. And so circumstantially, how did they, how did they grow up? And then, you know, what were their earlier on jobs? And I would say typically marketers get to that director level. And if they are heavily leaning, you know, they have that like, uh oh, moment where yeah. they realize their their gaps, and um, and I will just quickly say that you know it's not to say that you need to attempt to be equally good at all of it, but you need mm -hmm. to have a way to avail yourself, and even if that is um, who you assemble within your team, you know, do you have a data scientist that you can lean on if you know science isn't strong? for you? Do you have mm -hmm. someone who is a really creative problem solver and a great ideator, if that's not your stronger place? But it's not just, oh, I have a person for that, but it's also um, seeking to learn to a certain level. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the biggest premise in the book is be a strong generalist, mm. you know, Love as that. you go through the ranks, um, we all know the jack of all trades uh, saying, and um, and the actual saying, it's a Shakespeare actually. So we know jack of all trades, master of none. So it it it's it's criticism, right? It's basically mm -hmm. saying, well, if if you know a lot of things, like you don't really know anything. But the but the full quote actually is a jack of all trades, master of none is better than a master of one. Uh, there you go. So if, hey, you yeah, so he got it. <laughs> yeah, I feels like um, just on the career side for a second, um, it's like politics, right? If you want to get the nomination, you have to run to the right or to the left, depending on your party, right? And the second you get the nomination, you bang to the center to try to throw the big yeah, ten over as it, many people right? as possible. I mean, most so, do, not everyone. Well, well yeah, but, but some people go about, hard right, yeah, hard left. Yes. But most, if they're really trying to do right by, yeah, to get to get the most, you you move to the center, right? And and that's the point, which is going up a functional role. I need to be hard on the functional role, good at whatever my thing is, and then move more generalist at the point I get I'm elevated to yes. a level. So that, that wasn't trying to debate politics. I was yeah. sort of no, no, absolutely. And I'm I'm just yeah, I'm just having various political figures come into my mind as as I said. <laughs> but um, but there yeah, like. To your point, you know, a tangible example. So um, we've worked very closely with a chief marketing officer of a global spirits company. This mm. particular person grew up in the insights and analytics function for the longest time was a behavioral scientist who was really good in like, you know, the demand spaces space. I mean, this is really great data driven marketing. 
now finds herself a chief marketing officer. Mm-hmm. And so she's going to be really, really good at understanding that functional part, but needs to be equally good at managing through the strength of the creative and the advertising, for example, yeah. right? Which is much more on this side of things, not to mention the managerial side of managing across, you know, all the functions and the entire team. So you're you're going to have come from a function of some kind and you need that hat. Um, but you also need to figure out how you can avail yourself of those other skills that you didn't grow up in. So just elevating to the CEO, looking at this role for a second, um, what should we expect from our top marketing person in the organization? What kind of conversation, what kind of thinking, how do we know if they're doing a good job basically as yeah. CEOs? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question uh, because when I see a head of marketing in an organization struggling, um, usually one of the big gaps at play is a lack of alignment or even maybe it doesn't exist at all um, around what are the goals and objectives and the KPIs for the function. And it's a really important aspect, maybe a little bit more, just just a touch more important than other functions because marketing can feel so murky. Mm. It's, It's an inconvenient truth that when you're talking about performance marketing, it's a test and learn world. That's that's how you optimize. So nobody's yep. sitting there with the answers. It's not it's not black and white. It'd be amazing if it was, but it's not. So for the CEO who's listening, from your strategic plan, have that clear. You can have it crafted by your head of marketing. Maybe you feel like you want to you know start the draft. They start the you know whatever you think is going to like work best to get to a very clear and agreed plan of. What are they seeking to accomplish and how are we going to measure against that progress? Yep. Don't end up in that weird space of like, I just don't know what you're doing all day. Yeah. Yeah. It's no bueno. Um, and, you know, as an engineer, I love digital marketing because it's so quantitative. Yes. And funny enough, it, it avoids the art conversation for me because <laughs> I go, no, really think about it. I go, look, I don't know. Frankly, you don't know. So we're going to put it in the market and and see the, da- yeah. the data is yeah. going to tell us which one's better, right? Because I don't care if it's purple, red, yellow, as long as it works, right? Yeah. So and, I, and I, the part that you know that that's missing from all of that, and it and it's an and, not an or, is mm-hmm. what is your brand, and how is that showing up in that messaging that you're you know down in the weeds testing? Mm-hmm. So just because. A is doing better than B, let's say A does better than B every time, is A conveying the right thing about yeah. who you're trying to be and the, and the space that you're really trying to claim? So that's, you know, one of my, um, <laughs> one of the things that I, I feel like it's like my role in the world to, as we move more and more digital is yes, and we got to keep paying attention to brand. And, yep. and well, what space do you want to hold in the minds and hearts of the people that you serve? Interesting. You know, I, I had this experience with Google AdWords, so buying search words, right? And there were terms that would drive volume, but they really had nothing to do with what we do or the promise of the brand or anything. Exactly. And so, great, great I'm point. Like, right. And you could follow those metrics right out the window. Right. But then, but then who, who are you? Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's and where then, you need both. And, and even worse, they search and find you and they go, what's this? It doesn't make any sense against what I was looking for. Right. So even exactly. though it drove volume to the website, for example. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's um, a great well, example of it. Yeah. So, so Nancy, um, if people want the book, the new and improved super duper second version book. Yes. Where do they go? How do they get it? Um, Amazon is a great way. Um, and the, t- the title again. Yes. Um, how senior marketers scale the heights. Got it. Much shorter, much more pithy. Good. Well, um, I couldn't help myself with the byline of what's still true, more yeah. true, really true, but that is the, that is technically yeah. the title. Yeah. yeah. Now you have a Kindle and audiobook too. Um, I have, uh, I have audiobook 
uh, but I do not know if it's available on Amazon on Kindle at this point. Okay. Um, okay. But don't be deterred if it tells you, you know, limited supply, because that seems to go up and down by the day. Got it. Interesting. And then what if they want more of Noetic? What if they want more of yeah, your organization? I would, I would love to um, hear from people in uh, LinkedIn is a big go-to for us. So either our um, Noetic consultants page, or um, you can find me at Nancy McDonald Reuter and it's N-A-N-C-I-E. Um, and McDonald, the way McDonald Douglas spells it, not McDonald's that makes the Big Macs. Um, or the e, not, not the E-I-E-I-E-I-O one, not that one either. Not right? that okay. one. <laughs> yeah, not that one. And then our um, our website is uh, noeticconsultants.com. So you can reach us any of those ways. And I'd, I'd love to hear from your listeners. Beautiful. Well, this was awesome. I thought there were really interesting thoughts about managing marketers and the relationship of hard and soft and how what we should be looking for from our lead um, marketing person. Um, all really fabulous. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Delighted to spend the time with you as well. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. We'll see you next time on the Lazy CEO Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the CEO Project. At the CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com, or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.